Hi friends, want to eat to fight cancer? Here are my top 10 foods I eat daily. Now, although this is singling out individual foods, each of them only can go so far. And the greatest benefit is to get a diversity of food in your daily diet. Number 10 is a food I struggled to eat as a child. I think it's because it's sour and I ate so many sweet things that my palate always gravitated towards sugary processed foods. But when my mom started to grow this plant in her backyard, I realized that if you find a fresh one, it tastes even better than candy. That is the cherry tomato. Tomatoes are rich in lycopene, which has been shown in numerous studies to reduce the risk of prostate cancer. Now I know some kids won't eat it raw and that's because the supermarket tomatoes are tasteless, but that's okay if you can't find a farmer's market, then process your tomatoes. Now, I don't like processed food in general, unless it's healthier. It turns out processing tomatoes and making it into juice or sauce and heating it up actually releases more lycopene. Just avoid refined flour products like pizza crust, which will work against your goal to fight cancer. Just as a reminder, food isn't like a drug, which is designed to inhibit metabolic pathways. Real food gives your body thousands of building materials so your body can fight diseases. Ultimately, your body and your immune cells need a fight or you will lose a battle. Tomatoes are also rich in vitamin C, potassium, fiber, lutein, and zeaxanthin. Besides being beneficial to avoid prostate cancer, they help prevent depression and to help lose weight. And by the way, you have millions of cancer cells in your body right now. So do I. But if they don't grow, there's nothing to worry about because that's a part of life. It's like finding one ant in your house. That's no big deal. But when there is a whole army of ants, then you have an infestation. To prevent ants, the foundation of your house needs to be strong. Likewise, the foundation of your fortress, your body needs to be strong. If you build your house out of straw, you'll have ants left and right, especially if you leave sugar around, which is basically refined carbohydrates in pizza dough, white rice, bread, and pasta. Excess sugar suppresses your immune system to allow those cancers to grow. Now, the nutrients Americans need to focus on are not protein, carbs, or saturated fats. Most people have an A++++ in those nutrients. You guys are just overachievers. Just like studying for good grades, if you concentrate your efforts on the class you already have an A plus in, you won't elevate your GPA, your grade point average, because you're not working on the classes in which you are failing. Those classes will bring your GPA down. And as a nation, our dietary GPA is in the toilet because the standard American diet is failing to get enough fiber phytonutrients. Elevate your nutritional GPA by concentrating on phytonutrient-rich whole foods. There are over 300,000 phytonutrient-rich edible plants. If you don't like one, go look for another. There are over 150,000 phytonutrients. They are powerful molecules to give your fortress the equipment to prevent diseases, and hence, the more plants you eat, the stronger your fortress will be. Number nine is a spice that has been eaten in Asia for thousands of years. Why should we care about the history of food? That's because we can learn from populations that live the longest. I am comforted by the fact that generations of people have tested the diet and lived. The foods that we are eating are creations of modern industry invented in the last few decades and poisoning our metabolism. If you're following a new novel way of eating that appears to be beneficial in the short term, are you sacrificing your longevity? Hard to know until years later. Asians outlive Americans by over a decade. And for those of you into longevity, you should look into the Asian diet. There are no clinical trials that have followed people for thousands of years. Our country is less than 250 years old, and we have managed in the last 30 years to mass produce diabetes, obesity, and cancers, and export these delicious lab creations across the world. Turn your favorite food around. And if there is an ingredient list, especially with materials you can't find in your own cupboard, that's not real food. That's a lab created product. So my goal is to induce you to real food and how longevity cultures have eaten for eons. It's very rare to find clinical trials on food and toxins because it isn't ethical to poison people. Unfortunately, unexpected disasters happen 
often. And when there is nothing else, that's when people turn to food. And this is a story of arsenic poisoning. This spice actually was used to treat arsenic poisoning in Bangladesh. Arsenic is an environmental pollutant left by industry and commonly poisons water, even today. And that's why rice has high concentrations of arsenic. Rice needs a lot of water to grow. If you're eating processed rice products, you may want to reconsider eating them. They probably have arsenic. UNICEF thought they were bringing clean water to people in Bangladesh, but it turned out that the clean well waters were not so clean and had toxic amounts of invisible arsenic, and thousands of people came down with arsenicosis, which causes DNA mutations and cancers. This common spice, turmeric, which is how I pronounce it, it's spelled here, was shown to reverse the DNA damage caused by arsenic. Turmeric has many compounds, but the one people are interested in is curcumin, which is commonly sold as a supplement. Very little turmeric is actually absorbed in the blood when you eat it. Most people think black pepper increases the absorption. That's actually not correct. Black pepper has a molecule called piperine that inhibits an enzyme in the liver to prevent the liver from breaking down curcumin. So piperine makes whatever curcumin that is absorbed last longer in your bloodstream. However, this means there may be drug interactions. I personally don't take curcumin. I prefer turmeric extract with bromelain, an anti-inflammatory enzyme found only in pineapples. Bromelain actually does increase absorption levels of turmeric. And best of all, there is no known drug interactions with bromelain and it appears to work synergistically to reduce inflammation. If you want to know what I take, I have a link in the show notes below. But it's actually beneficial for turmeric not to be absorbed as its presence in the colon can help prevent colonic polyps, which can lead to colon cancer. And if you haven't noticed, colon cancer is rising in young people. I've seen many young people with aggressive, severe colon cancer in their 20s and 30s in this last decade of practicing medicine. It is sad and unbelievable. We've already reduced the screening rate of colonoscopies to 45 years of age. So if you meet the age criteria and you haven't gotten your colonoscopy, then please make an appointment with a gastroenterologist to get your colonoscopy to screen for colon cancer. But our current screening practices won't help those young people. And young talents like Chadwick Boseman, he sadly succumbed to colon cancer. So screening isn't practical. The reality is we also don't have enough gastroenterologists to screen everyone. And if you depend on screening to prevent colon cancer, you've missed the boat of health. The goal is to prevent polyps. That is what they are looking for, abnormal growth. And if your diet has any meat, including chicken, red meat, and processed meats, you are at a higher risk of getting colon and rectal polyps. Processed meats are especially bad as they are associated with advanced colorectal cancers. And you may have a diet rich in those foods or know someone who's elderly and don't have colorectal cancer. Well, that's great for you and them, but it's like smoking. Some people can do it for a long time and be okay, but that's not most of us. It's like parachuting. Many people can safely parachute out of planes, but then you get those who get fractures. What's your risk tolerance? Unless you are a healthcare worker or have personally helped someone who has fought cancer, you may not understand the journey of surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. This is a hard road to travel. And personally, I have a low risk tolerance. I would rather reduce my risk of diseases than have to go through treatment because it may not work. Number eight is a powerful seed that contains lignans. Lignans are found in a variety of plants, including a variety of seeds, grains, fruits, vegetables, and berries. Lignans appear to block an inflammatory molecule called interleukin-1. Interleukin-1 is one mechanism by how the blockbuster cancel chemotherapy drug tamoxifen works. Tumor cells have interleukin-1 receptors. And when interleukin-1 binds to the receptors, it makes the cancer grow stronger and behave more aggressively to invade. And for pennies a day, you can eat flax seeds to reduce your breast cancer risk and boost the effects of the drug tamoxifen if you're on it. And one month of just eating a few spoonsfuls of flax seeds, it appears to increase the anti-inflammatory inhibitor levels by over 50%. And the best part about eating food is that they don't have the cost or the side effects of the drugs. I eat flax seed for this reason in hopes to prevent breast cancer. Number seven is to look for foods high in phytates. Phytates are plant phytonutrients known to inhibit the absorption of minerals. But wait, isn't that bad? Well, it depends on the mineral. 
and how much of that you are getting. For example, iron is a mineral necessary for life. It is why your blood is red. Iron is used to make hemoglobin and myoglobin to transport oxygen to your entire body and to make energy. And there are two forms of iron that people eat. Heme iron, which is found in red meat, poultry, and seafood, and non-heme iron, which are found in plants. Non-heme iron is not absorbed as easily as heme iron. And this is why people on plant-exclusive diets can get iron deficient if they lose blood. However, vitamin C will help to increase the absorption of iron, so it's beneficial to eat iron-rich foods with vitamin C-rich foods. But if you're on a processed food vegan diet, you are at higher risk of being iron deficient if you're menstruating and not eating the right foods. But excess iron can also be fatal. And we know this because iron supplements that look like red chocolate candies have killed children who have mistaken and swallowed their parents' iron supplements. Adults who have chronic blood transfusions unfortunately also get liver inflammation and cirrhosis from iron overload. I see these people. Unfortunately, this is a major problem in people who have sickle cell disease. You see, your body can get rid of iron and it is stored in your organs like your liver, your brain, and your muscle, and it's toxic in excess. And I'm sure you've seen a rusty red nail. That nail is made out of iron. That's oxidative stress that happens with iron in your body. Your body is literally a chemistry lab and everything you eat will ultimately be converted to the molecules you see on the periodic table of elements that you learned in elementary school. The rules of organic chemistry with the electrons moving between cations and anions apply to your body. So when you have a meat-centered diet, you will overload your system with oxidative stress and with iron, which is not only toxic to your organs and excess, but also causes inflammation in your gut. And this is why heme iron is associated with an increased risk of colon cancer. Eating red meat once a week doubles your risk of getting colon cancer. But along with your meat, if you ate beans, which are rich in phytates, it can help reduce that risk, not only because it binds iron, but phytates are known to starve cancer cells and enhance the immune system, specifically natural killer cells, which are white blood cells important with your first line of defense, your innate immunity that not only scouts out cancerous cells, but also germs like bacteria, fungi, and viruses. Phytates are known to help rehabilitate cancerous cells and help them revert back to normal cells it's like rehabilitating people who break the law and then help them get along with society. In fact, prisoners who were fed a plant-based diet were less violent and had lower rates of recidivism. When you eat whole plants, part of that food is feeding your gut microbiome, which converts fiber into short-chain fatty acids like butyrate to help prevent depression. So if you're struggling with your mood and patience, maybe you aren't eating enough whole plants with fiber. Feeding prisoner plants will also save taxpayer money because the food will be cheaper and there will be less diseases, including colon cancer. If prisoners develop colon cancer, the prison system will still have to treat them. So in the end, colon cancer may be determined by your meat to vegetable ratio. I still cook and soak beans thoroughly to reduce the phytates in beans. There's a fine line between no absorption and some absorption. Number six is a fruit that I love to eat straight out of my mother's garden pots. My parents were avid gardeners and I benefited from their green thumbs. When this fruit is picked fresh, it's fragrant, juicy, and extra sweet, but hardly has any calories. In German, it translates to the earth berry. She would buy this fruit at the supermarket and pour the rinse water full of seeds in her garden pots. If you get strawberries, you would be correct. I buy my strawberries from a local farmer and luckily I live in sunny Southern California so I have access to local strawberries all year round. My kids' friends always comment that the fruit tastes different at our house. Strawberries have been shown to reverse mild to moderate precancerous lesions in the esophagus. Risk factors to getting esophageal cancer include reflux, smoking, and alcohol. And if you haven't heard, esophageal cancer rates are rising faster than breast cancer or prostate cancer. I had a friend a few years back who was widowed because her husband had esophageal cancer. He was maybe 50. 28% of Americans suffer from either heartburn and or acid reflux, two risk factors for esophageal cancer. And many people take acid reducers to help with symptoms, but unfortunately, they put themselves at risk to infections like pneumonia, intestinal infections, and fractures. Acid reducers should be used as short-term relief, not a forever drug. Addressing the root cause is always best. And there are several risk factors to reflux, including 
eating high fat meals. Fat loosens a door that separates your esophagus from the stomach and it triggers an enzyme called cholecystokinin that opens a door called the esophageal sphincter. Fat also delays the emptying of food from the stomach. The pH of your stomach can be below the pH of Coke, which is 2.6. A colleague of mine said her dad used to pour Diet Coke to clean his car engine. She never drank any more soda after that. Apparently, you can clean a lot of stuff with Coke from this article. Now, even though your stomach has a lower pH, your esophagus should be around 7. So anything super acidic, whether it's Coke, vinegar, or your own stomach acid, will irritate the esophagus. I stopped drinking Coke, but I do eat vinegar. I just always eat it with food. Number five is a B vitamin rich food that is high in beta glucans. Beta glucans are a form of fiber that interacts with your immunity, increasing your power to heal if you have wounds and burns. Small studies on terminal cancer patients in Japan suggest that for pennies a day, this food, nutritional yeast or brewer's yeast may extend their lives by a few months. This is not the same as baker's yeast, which is a different yeast. Thousands of dollars are spent per patient for palliative chemotherapy, which unfortunately comes with a lot of side effects, decreasing the quality of life of these people. Unlike nutritional yeast, too bad no one is testing nutritional yeast against palliative chemotherapy. Nonetheless, studies have not shown negative effects in cancer patients taking nutritional yeast, so it seems like a food worth trying. And you can sprinkle it on anything or cook with it. I sometimes use it as a thickener. Number four is a food that adds umami flavor to food. Umami is a Japanese word to describe the unique and delicious taste of amino acids and or nucleic acids like DNA. In another episode, I misspelled the word and I'm probably still saying it wrong as I don't speak Japanese. So I apologize to my Japanese friends. And when you taste food, there are five basic tastes sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. And this is why food with the added flavor enhancer, monosodium glutamate, MSG, is super tasty. But it can cause a Chinese fried rice syndrome in which you may get headaches, numbness, palpitations, flushing, sweating, weakness, burning, or tingling in the face after eating foods with MSG. By the way, MSG is in your fast food. It's in your chips, your crackers, your frozen meals, your processed meats, your soups, your condiments, your instant noodles that are not Chinese. Read your labels. MSG and other glutamate derivatives make food super tasty, and that's why you like those foods. Those symptoms are called excitatory symptoms, and you may have experienced some of them under stressful times maybe before an important meeting or presentation. I had a friend who would throw up in the bathroom before her exams in medical school. She had bad excitatory symptoms. Luckily, as physicians, we don't have to take exams every week anymore. Now it's just every time we want to renew our boards. I have two board certifications, so I'm taking exams every quarter. But there are some doctors who grandfathered out of those rules. Unfortunately, I'm not that old to have benefited. So the mind can make the body really sick under stress, partially due to glutamate, an excitatory neurotransmitter in your brain. Your brain is made out of cells called neurons that already have pre-made glutamate stored in bags called vesicles. Under the right conditions, it will be released, kind of like releasing balloons at a wedding. By the way, just don't use mylar balloons. They're very harmful for the environment. Now, neurons have octopus-like fingers to touch on their neurons. One neuron can connect to over 10,000 other neurons. So messages get relayed faster than a viral social media post. And that's why when you touch something hot in less than a second, you will move your hand before you burn yourself. Imagine if we had that kind of collaboration and government, so many of our problems would be solved. Neurons speak to each other through these signaling molecules called neural transmitters, and glutamate is one of them. There's actually over a hundred neural transmitters, and you may have heard of some of them, serotonin and dopamine. Glutamate is super important. It's essential, but your body can make it. It's also special because it is a master neurotransmitter. And you can actually change your glutamate levels by exercising and practice mindfulness. But too much is not necessarily better. People with chronic pain have higher glutamate levels. So how does glutamate work? Think of a neurotransmitter as a key and the receptors as a locks. The key is useless unless you can open a lock. 
I have a bunch of useless keys in my drawers and I wish I had a master key that can open all the locks in my home. Glutamate is like that master key and can interact with four different receptors in your brain. 90% of the excitement that happens in your brain is due to glutamate. And like everything else in your body, like sugar, like fat and proteins, glutamate needs to be in the right amount. Too much will make you feel horrible and too little will make you feel horrible. My friend got too much glutamate before testing time. The body regulates glutamate through your food, mood, and activity. If you don't eat, it will break down your own muscles to get it since glutamate is an amino acid that is found in muscle tissue. In case you haven't heard, your muscles are a buffer for more important body parts like your brain, liver, and even your skeleton. So when you are hungry, it can supply food to your body via your liver, a process called gluconeogenesis. And people who have more muscles are simply more stable on their feet so they don't fall and suffer fractures like people who don't have muscles. You should work to increase your muscle mass, which is primarily through resistant exercises. That's why I do resistant exercises twice a week, targeting my hip, my spine, and my forearms, as those are the three most common areas that get fractured. If you're over 40, you are losing muscle mass every year unless you work on building it. As a master neurotransmitter, glutamate contributes to feelings of stress and anxiety and depression. Glutamate regulates sleep. Glutamate is also important for learning and memory and as fuel for your brain when glucose is absent. We don't have enough glucose to make ATP energy for your brain. Glutamate will be used in the same metabolic pathway called the Krebs cycle to crank out ATP energy in your mitochondria. And this is why when you go on a low carbohydrate diet or a fasting diet, your muscles will get broken down to make glutamate, which then turns into glucose. And by the way, when you eat an excessive amount of protein, unless you're building muscle like an athlete, that protein doesn't get stored as muscle. There's no storage depot for protein other than muscle tissue, which you can't build much unless you exercise. Any excess protein that you eat and don't use for the day is stored as fat. And hence, when you don't eat carbohydrates, your body still needs to get glucose somewhere. It is true, you don't need to eat any glucose or any carbohydrates. But if you don't, you will break muscle tissue to meet your essential glucose needs. It's still an essential energy molecule. And you can measure this change on your calf muscle. And you can read all about the biochemistry of upregulating hormones like cortisol and reducing hormones like insulin and insulin growth factors on low carbohydrate and ketogenic diet in this article that explains how muscle tissue is destroyed. Now, although it is true that carbohydrates are not essential for life, could they be essential for longevity? However, anything in excess is usually toxic. So diets on either extreme, either low carbohydrate or high carbohydrate may be increasing mortality. And I can tell you from my clinical experience that I see people who struggle with infectious diseases when they are on the extreme, on low carbohydrate diets or highly processed carbohydrate diets. If eating a low carbohydrate diet was optimal for performance, why don't we have elite athletes eating low carbohydrate diets? The ketogenic diet is 70 to 80% fat and 10 to 20% protein. And it has been around since 1920 invented as a diet to treat seizures. If anybody wants to optimize performance, that would be athletes. Bodybuilders are different. They have big muscles, but they don't perform like endurance athletes. That's why marathon runners are super skinny. And there's a whole bunch of omnivorous athletes who have become predominantly whole food plant-based. And here's a list of some of them. You may recognize some of these people. No matter what diet you eat, the quality of your food makes a huge difference in your health. Removing toxins is number one. Great health benefits will come just by giving up toxins. Processed foods loaded with refined sugars, enriched flours, saturated fats, emulsifiers, gums, and other chemicals are toxic and destroy your mitochondria, your gut microbiome, and your immune system. These are basically hyper palatable addictive junk disguised as normal food in your breakfasts, lunches, dinners, and snacks that are contributing to our mental health crisis and lower IQs in our children. I'm flabbergasted that New York is serving children Lunchables at school or private schools who partner with fast food chains to serve lunches and sell candy. These energy-rich carbohydrate 
elongate fat bombs are the main contributors to metabolic diseases like fatty liver, diabetes, and poor outcomes for infectious diseases and bad outcomes for cancers. Cutting these foods out no matter how you do it, whether it's using drugs like Ozempic, not eating, basically fasting, going on a low carbohydrate diet, a ketogenic diet, a carnivore diet, or a whole food plant-based diet will all essentially remove these toxins that are driving the mental health and metabolic crisis plaguing our societies. And if you find yourself thinking negative thoughts, being impatient with your kids, getting angry, lashing out on people, saying unkind words, or writing mean comments on social media, then maybe it's due to the foods that you're eating. Getting rid of toxic foods can improve your mood, reverse metabolic problems like fatty liver and diabetes, and overall, you'll just lose weight. However, if you don't pick the right diet and be able to stick to it for life, when you stop, the diseases and mood problems will return. The other thing is, what other organ could you be harming? And could you be harming your immune system and wake up 10 years later fighting for your life with cancer? Are you willing to take that chance? I'm not. So instead of following people who have made up diets that are less than 100 years old, I'm following longevity cultures like old people in Asia and the Seven Day Adventist community at Loma Linda, California, who eat like the older generation in Asia. Now back to MSG. When you eat MSG, your body converts that to glutamate, and it's still debated on whether or not MSG actually causes these symptoms. I think each person is different, and if it alters your glutamate level, it absolutely can cause symptoms. But usually, they're going to be transient. And I know several people who can tell if there's MSG in food because they simply feel different. My husband is one of them, but I can't taste or smell the difference. He's like the canary in the coal mine. If the canary is telling me there's MSG in the food, I'm not eating it. It's like giving someone the master key to your house. And when you unnaturally increase a natural molecule that can interact with your body, with no feedback control. That's potentially very harmful. And this is why I believe all the additives, including fiber additives that they use in bread, are not healthy and they will change your gut microbiome, your largest immune organ, in ways in which we have yet to discover. I did a bread video and got a lot of feedback on why fiber additives are used to manipulate the texture of breads to make it moist and fluffy. And I got remarks as if they're doing it on purpose. Well, they are doing it on purpose because baking is a chemistry and it actually is quite fun to do. I used to do it. But adding fiber is no different than using sugar to change the taste and texture of your food. It's highly processed food. I try to avoid food additives, even when they have other good ingredients. And just in general, chemically synthesized stuff processed out from plants or made in a lab, like sugar and fiber additives, they're not real food. I'm not perfect when it comes to food. I do have some, but it's limited. I still like tasty food. So instead, I aim for foods that can give me the umami flavor, all naturally without some kind of processing. And that is mushrooms. I've eaten mushrooms all my life and my all-time favorite is the shiitake mushroom number four. Eating just two shiitake mushrooms a day can increase your immune system all while lowering inflammation. Shiitake mushrooms have a compound called lentinin which was used in clinical trials to shrink lung cancers. Lentinin appears to have improved the survival of the lives of those with advanced lung cancers by 25 days which isn't a lot but better than nothing for pennies a day. I would absolutely absolutely cook shiitake mushrooms and not eat them raw. Number three, if you can't find shiitake mushrooms, then white button mushrooms are great too. Eating half a cup to a cup of white button mushrooms a day has shown in some people to reduce their prostate-specific antigen, a marker for prostate cancer. Now, it didn't happen to everybody, but if you respond to a cup of mushrooms a day, wouldn't that be great? Number two is to get this bean that I grew up with. Actually, my ancestors have eaten this bean since 11th century BC. Rutgers Agricultural College in 1879 was the first to test this ancient bean, but it was mostly used as fertilizer in America until World War II when they processed it into oils and edible fats. But it wasn't until the 1970s when William Shirtleff, a Stanford-trained engineer, introduces soybean and soy foods to America with his research and publications. Now I know there's a lot of controversy about soy foods, just like there's a lot of controversy about estrogen hormone replacement. 
but one has been eaten by my ancestors for thousands of years, and the other is a hormone isolated since 1942 from the urine of pregnant horses, pregnant mare urine, hence the name Premarin. Mammals all have estrogen. You have estrogen, whether you're male or female. So if you eat poultry or beef or pork or products made from mammals like milk, you're eating the same estrogen hormones that are in your body. Mammalian estrogen hormones are thousands of times more estrogenic than endocrine disrupting chemicals found in your water carried by plastic water bottles. That is why Premarin, remember from a horse, is an effective treatment for postmenopausal symptoms which are uncomfortable, but they don't kill people. Dr. Michael Greger made an excellent summary of the environmental estrogen pollution caused by farm animal waste. Certain plants have unique phytoestrogens, but no plant has estrogen. And yes, many plant chemicals interact with your body and modulate your hormones. Cyanide from the middle of an apple seed is an all natural and quite deadly in small amounts. Cane sugar or your table sugar is also deadly, but it takes pounds and pounds and decades to kill you. But it too raises hormones like insulin. So there is no animal or plant product that has no effect on your hormones. Soybean is concentrated in unique phytoestrogens called isoflavones, specifically genistein and dadzein, which both have a much weaker effect than your own estrogens or any other animal estrogen, and they can also exert anti-estrogenic effects. Different soy products have different amounts of isoflavones, as in this table. Your body also makes different estrogens. Premenopausal women have higher estradiol from the ovaries, and when they eat plant phytoestrogens, those plant phytoestrogens will act more like anti-estrogens, protecting your bodies from the negative effects of too much estrogen. However, postmenopausal women don't have much estradiol, and they benefit actually from the weak estrogenic effects of isoflavones. That's why it reduces postmenopausal symptoms. And if you're a man, you may have heard it can cause gynecomastia, enlargement of breast tissue. Sure, if you mega dose soy and drink three quarts of soy milk, who does that? I see a lot of people with gynecomastia, but they aren't eating any soy products. Here's a list of the more common causes of gynecomastia that have nothing to do with food. Think about it. How many Asians do you know walking around with gynecomastia? There are billions of Asians in this world. Why do we not have more than one report from one person in the literature with gynecomastia from eating soy. I suspect he probably had other problems too. I know this is confusing. We have two types of estrogen receptors, alpha and beta receptors that affect tissue differently, and they actually have opposite effects. Beta receptors inhibit breast growth, and phytoestrogens like genistein in the soybean, they target beta receptors to stop breast cancer growth. Genistein is a very weak alpha receptor trigger, which promotes growth, and your own estrogen triggers alpha receptors. You have to mega dose soybeans and eat way over two dozen cups a day to even come close to the potency of Premarin. The liver has alpha receptors, and when that's triggered, it releases clotting factors. And that's why people on Premarin can get blood clots. The uterus has alpha receptors, and your own estrogen promotes it to grow. Alpha receptors also promote breast tissue to grow when stimulated. Animal estrogen, just like your own estradiol and estrone, will promote your breasts and uterine tissues to grow because they activate alpha receptors. And that's why Premarin increases the risk of breast cancer and uterine cancer. If you have an estrogen receptor positive cancer, you may be offered tamoxifen, which blocks the receptor to compete with estrogen to prevent the cancer from growing. My goal is to prevent cancer with food. And women who eat soy can reduce their risk of endometrial cancer by 30%. As an added bonus, it can dramatically reduce menopausal symptoms without the nasty side effects of medications like Premarin. If you are on Premarin and don't have side effects, that's great for you. As a medical doctor, I think less is more. So I try to find foods that can help preserve health span. For myself, I drink soy milk because I don't want to get bone fractures as I age. This study showed an increase in bone marrow density, especially in the lumbar spine when people eat soy. My dad suffered a lumbar spine fracture that was the beginning of the end of his quality of life. So I'm trying to do whatever I can not to suffer the same fate. Bone density, however, is meaningless unless you can reduce fractures. And that's why osteoporosis drugs don't work as intended 
as they can destroy bone and cause fractures. Soy, on the other hand, has been shown to reduce fractures, unlike dairy, which is associated with higher fracture rate. Dairy milk is not so good for bones, opposite of the marketing propaganda that it was fed to us as children. Luckily, I've never really liked the taste of dairy, and I figure I am lactose intolerant, like most people in this world, for a reason. Lactose is a disaccharide sugar broken down by an enzyme called lactase into two sugars, galactose and glucose. And for those of us who are lactose intolerant, we don't have that enzyme lactase. So when we eat lactose, it does not get broken down, but it brings us down with horrible abdominal pain and diarrhea as our bodies are trying to expel it out of our system. The last time I had any dairy was with my last pregnancy over a decade ago. And honestly, I felt like I was going to die on the toilet. So that was the last time with my dairy eating adventures. Our bodies do make a little galactose, which is also found in small amounts in plants. But high levels of galactose are toxic, just like high levels of the sugar glucose is toxic. In fact, countries with the highest dairy milk consumption have the highest fracture rates and also have a higher mortality. Keep in mind, the study was not on fermented dairy products like yogurt and cheese, which appear to be more beneficial than drinking non-fermented milk. Could it be fermented dairy doesn't have galactose? No one quite knows yet. High dairy consumption does, however, make children grow taller, but at a cost. Milk intake is associated with higher prostate cancer risk, and we know that many cancers start in childhood, such as melanoma. And this study found that women who have teenage acne had higher risk of melanoma. Milk consumption increases acne. I heard the Duchess of York is fighting malignant melanoma right now, and I wish her all the best and hope her treatments are as successful as the treatments that President Jimmy Carter received to cure his melanoma. This is why it's important to feed our children healthy foods. I encourage my children to eat soy because eating soy as children, teenagers, and adults are all associated with a decreased risk of breast cancer. And by the way, men can get breast cancer too. If you're against soy because it is GMO or have been sprayed with glyphosate, then buy organic. I personally think people are missing out of the health benefits of soy that have been tested by thousands of years by millions of people. And now we have several clinical trials showing benefits. Plus the countries who eat soy live over 10 years longer than the average person in America. Now, please don't confuse traditional Asian soy products like tofu, soy milk, and edamame beans with modern day processed soy products added to foods like soybean oil and soy protein isolates. I'm not a fan of isolated plant products, whether it's sugar, fiber, or protein isolates. I also avoid soy cheese, soy sauce, and soy burgers. I try to eat organic soybeans whenever possible. Number one is a drink that I've watched my dad drink his entire life. He basically had this beer mug that he never washed because he would pour boiling hot water on these leaves multiple times a day to drink. His white ceramic mug turned brown inside. Now, I don't know if it added flavor, kind of like what people do with an iron skillet, which by the way, I would not recommend people to use due to high iron concentrations in your food. I got rid of my iron skillet years ago. Now your mouth, probably undergoes more trauma than your hands. I've burned my gums drinking hot soups and tea. I've cut my gums with razor sharp crackers and breads and bitten my cheeks countless times. Trauma to tissue, whether it's mechanical or chemical, promotes cancers. Now I've treated many people who have developed oral cancers and those people have never smoked or chewed on tobacco, which are two well-known risk factors. Oral cancers are not only very disfiguring because it involves the face, but treatments with radical surgery and radiation make it very difficult to swallow. And that's why I don't smoke anything or chew tobacco, but I do drink green tea daily just like my dad. Tea is also another ancient Chinese food, tracing back to 2737 BC. The story goes that the Chinese emperor Shen Nong mistakenly drank water with dead tea leaf boiled inside and he loved the taste. And the reason why I drink green tea is not because of the taste. I don't actually like it. I drink it for its immune properties and its ability to reverse DNA damage in precancerous oral lesions. What's even better is that after you drink green tea, your gut microbiome will ferment it to other compounds like 3,4-DHPA 
that have anti-colon cancer activity. And in this study with 136 patients who got green tea extracts for a year, they found 50% less polyps. And when they did find polyps, they were 25% smaller. That's the whole point of getting a colonoscopy to screen for polyps and removing them early before they turn cancerous. Participants drank four cups of green tea a day, which is honestly really hard for me to do because Tea keeps me up at night and I try not to drink my tea with meals as it inhibits iron absorption. Now, if you want to learn more about powerful foods, check out the next video.